<clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, um, never in the history of civilization has there been a topic such as coding so irrelevant to the immediate times we live in uh, and possibly so tedious. But I sincerely hope the real world will return and paediatric departments, especially in adult hospitals, will still be regarded as an expensive and wasteful resource. So I'm here to discuss part of the solution. Uh, it's impossible to explain how NHS finances work, but I will try to do so in one slide. The NHS has a fixed amount of money, barring political pressures such as now. How it is distributed is a source of endless wrangling. The politicians wanted competition between trusts and uh, hospitals, so now they have got it. And I'm always struck by Franz Kafka's The Trial uh, because he made some very prescient remarks that apply to the NHS. It's only because of their stupidity that they're able to be so sure of themselves that this mad system works. All trusts are effectively made to compete with each other for a slice of the pot. And it is a very unedifying sight. Um, so, as Robert Kennedy said, don't get mad, get even. It can be, in fact, summarised by uh, Laurel and Hardy's immortal sketch. Uh, hi, Dr. Rosenthal, if you're having trouble, if you just click the um, click the slide and then try right and left on your keyboard and it should advance. No, I'm, it's working all right. Anyway, why should I give this talk? Well, entirely by accident, <clears throat> I have chaired Chapter P, Paediatrics, the expert working group since 2011, that consisting of specialists, specialist and general paediatricians, plus paediatric finance uh, people from around England. So, for example, we have a nephrologist from Great Ormond Street, a rheumatologist from Alder Hay, a general paediatrician who is also the deputy chief executive from Epsom, the finance director of Sheffield Children's Hospital, etc., etc., and people from the NHS Information Centre in Leeds, whom we advise. <clears throat> the reason I also do it is everybody says I'm a long way along the autistic spectrum. And as I've, as Atul said, my name isn't Rosenthal for nothing. The take home message from this talk is everything everyone writes in the notes turns into money. I appreciate that doctors and especially paediatricians are not particularly interested in money. But if you don't have it, you can't spend it. And that's what paediatricians are good at. And it isn't necessary to accept everything I say as true or even correct, but it, one must only accept it as necessary. So <clears throat> what do coders do? I don't think many people actually realize that coders exist, but they are a group of clerks who work in the hospital and classify everything that happens in a hospital into numbers. And the primary classification is based on the International Classification of Diseases, ICD-10, which is updated every couple of years. The last one was uh, this time last year. If there are procedures or operations, that is uh, uh, coded by OPCS 4.8 due to be 4.9. And it is an incredibly elaborate uh, system uh, developed and maintained by the Clinical Classification Service. And you can see, you can even divide it whether you have an operation on your kidney on the left side 
or indeed an operation on the right side. Dr. Rosenthal, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt. It does appear as though your slides are not advancing for us. <clears throat> they may be advancing on your screen, but they don't appear to be advancing for the attendees. Perhaps you might just, where you are, if you click the stop sharing button and then restart the sharing from that slide, um, then it might just give it a, give it a bit of a jolt. Um, that's right, yeah. And if you restart the sharing. And then the sharing box, that's right. Then there's, there should be the one with the PowerPoint icon. Okay. Uh, well, side by side is also what I want. Uh, it's a good shortcut, actually. If you if you hop, if you're on the slide you want to start on, hold down Shift and press F five. Hit full screen from that point. Right. Um. Ah, there we go. Just would you mind clicking a slide back? There we go. That's now advancing for us. Thank you. Terribly sorry to interrupt. Okay. Um, so I was talking about ICD-10 codes and OPCS procedure codes, but I'm going to keep off the procedure codes as they apply less to respiratory paediatrics. Um, and then what happens is that all these codes that people write about the patients you have been seeing get grouped into what is known as hospital-related groups, HRG. And there are about 3,000 of those covering all aspects of adult and indeed paediatric uh, practice. And what is an HRG? That is an aggregated group of patient data that is supposed to be clinically meaningful, is expected to be similar in terms of how much it costs, has a reasonable number of patients so that you can get some reasonable um, average data, and is generated from data that all hospitals have to supply. These HRGs are related into several subchapters, related often with body systems, starting with the head at A and finishing with urology and gynecology, and then odds and ends after that. Now, chapter P is of course pediatrics and is a diagnosis rather than a procedure driven chapter and PD needless to say is res pediatric respiratory and it matches to an extent with what chapter D is which is adult respiratory. Now I show you this list not for you to read but to show that there are relatively few pediatric respiratory HRGs and you can see the prices in the right hand column um, of what money you get. And you see there's PD-11, which is upper respiratory tract infections, PD-12, which is asthma or wheezing. But you also see that there are CC scores and you see, and that stands for complications and comorbidities. So if you have a complicated patient or a simple patient, a simple patient will have no complications or comorbidities. And as they rise up, this complication scores rise, and that's associated with more money. Um, and that is what we are in the business of generating. So everything groups to an HRG, and the computer program that generates this HRG is incredibly complicated. And even after 10 years after doing this chairing of this committee, I still don't really understand it. Anyway, on the whole, procedures will trump a diagnosis. So if somebody comes in with an empyema and has a decortication, that will come at the top of the list. But a diagnosis will always pay better than a smaller procedure, such as a sleep study or removal of stitches or a sweat test or anything like that. Other procedures may also be taken into account and complications and comorbidities are really important. Now, I'm not expecting you to 
through this slide, but from costs, which comes at the top, to what you get paid coming at the bottom of this slide is incredibly complicated, needlessly so, and is at least 40 steps. But the end result is as follows. Everything you do, so if you come into hospital with asthma, that will be a single episode. However, if you come into hospital with pneumonia, go to theatre for a drain or surgery, go to intensive care afterwards, and then come back to the ward. Those are several episodes which added together comes to a spell. There are then all sorts of things like market forces adjustment, where Truro Hospital in Cornwall is counted as the cheapest place to practice medicine, and the Chelsea and Westminster is the most expensive. Everything has to balance out with the total amount of money available. There are all sorts of inflation and efficiency adjustments, drugs, devices, etc., etc. However, the end result, of course, is that the, what you get paid is always less than what it costs. So it's no wonder that all departments make a loss. But, for example, an empyema will have many parts. The drain is priced separately, the intensive care stay is priced separately, and the ward stay is priced separately. And all of them can be influenced to maximise your return, which is appropriate to the work you have put in. Likewise, someone with a cough or a wheeze or snoring never comes as a day case for a sleep study or a difficult asthma assessment or a sweat test. They came for a reason. They had symptoms of cough or wheeze or recurrent infections or snoring or apnea or breathlessness. And if you do that, you get a lot more money for your patient. So here are a couple of golden rules which I would like you to remember. In the notes, you use terms like confirmed diagnosis, probable diagnosis, presumed diagnosis, clinical diagnosis, treat as or working diagnosis. You do not use symptoms, possible diagnosis, query diagnosis, delta delta, which I appreciate is very commonly written, impression, suspected diagnosis or likely diagnosis, because the coders by law are not allowed to use the words you use after this um, stem starting point. You may say it is completely crazy, and like Frank Ka Franz Kafka's The Trial, it is completely crazy, but that's the game we have to play. The second golden rule, as I emphasized a couple of slides ago, is that day cases do not come for blood tests, sweat tests, sleep studies, echoes, CT scans, or Zolaire therapy. They come for the investigation and management of all the symptoms or diagnosis they have. So if they come with asthma for Zolaire, and I will go into this in more detail shortly, you write the diagnosis they have and then you write the test or treatment they have, but never the other way around. So, for example, Zolaire treatment. You will be perhaps surprised and disappointed to learn that the very sensible term problematic asthma cannot be coded, so should not be written. They never come for Zolaire therapy. Now, the next series of slides are all the same. They are slightly complicated, but I will go through them in uh, slowly so you get the pattern of what we are doing. So here is the age of the patient at 12 years. That is entirely arbitrary. Here is the gender of the patient. Here is the diagnosis, which in this case was predominantly allergic asthma. And you will see that they have a code here of pediatric asthma and wheezing with a CC score, and you get, oops, um, what happened there? Um, uh, 
and they you received for that 355 pounds why it has a dollar sign is one of life's unsolved mysteries in this program but it means pounds however i'm going to now take you through i hope so that you understand um, how that might be improved because there are a lot of people involved in problematic or severe asthmatics and 355 pounds doesn't remotely pay for it. So if you uh, now put in addition and the blue book, personal history of long term current use of other medications for which inhaled steroids you can absolutely guarantee they will be on you can see now that pediatric asthma and wheezing now has a cc score of one to three and the money you receive has gone up in the bottom right hand corner to 439 pounds um if you then add in for example other atopic dermatitis, they have eczema or some other thing, you will see at the bottom right hand corner that the price doesn't change. Um, now, if for example, as many children will have had, you have done a bronchoscopy and you find pulmonary eosinophils in the lavage, then you can change um, it from allergic asthma to pulmonary eosinophilia not elsewhere classified. And now you see that the uh, HRG, that overriding grouping, has changed dramatically to what's called PD-14. The amount of money you get has now gone up to over a thousand pounds. You still put down that you had long term use of inhaled steroids. However, if you now add other atopic dermatitis that they had eczema as well, as an example, you will also find that now the price has gone up even further and you have now reached seventeen hundred pounds. Uh, Dr. Rosenthal, I'm sorry to interrupt. It does appear though, as though your slides have stopped. I think it's looking at the PowerPoint program and the slides that you're seeing, are, ah, that's better. Yes, now we can see, thank you. Okay. One of the other quirks you have to at least consider is that if somebody who was younger than this child, which is usual, you know, most people under the age of five or six, which I grant you is unlikely to be on Zolaire, but have, functional enuresis. Children under six or seven, they wet the bed at night quite commonly and it is not organic. But you can see the incredible effect that it has on uh, the price in the bottom right hand corner. You're now up to £2,900. Why am I telling you this? This is only to demonstrate that you must take into account everything that is relevant to the child's clinical state. So if you go on to sleep medicine, if you are admitted for a sleep study and it's right, come in for sleep study, you will receive as a procedure, because that's what it is, about £350. But I want to emphasise that no one is randomly admitted for a sleep study. You came in for a reason, sleep disordered breathing, snoring, apnea, etc. So in going through this slide, you will see that you have a three-year-old who is a girl who came from home uh, from a waiting list, etc. And now you will see that in the blue bar on the left side that it has been coded as other and unspecified abnormalities of breathing. And you will get for that uh, this thing called PD-65 and rather than £350, you will get £673, all of which is completely genuine. Now, if, for example, there was a history of sleep apnea, you will get exactly the same amount of money and that does not change. However, 
If the child is overweight and obesity unspecified is merely being more than the 98th centile on the BMI chart, which is going to be quite common in children uh, with these issues, uh, you can see that other things now change. On the right, you get what's called, uh, you now have an extra complication and the money goes up. If in addition, they are three and for reasons as all they are in nappies, the money goes up again. I don't, I can't explain why. And if it goes further that they have tonsillar hypertrophy, etc., cetera, et cetera, um, it is worth stating that um, you can't grade, you can't code for grades of tonsils. So tonsillar hypertrophy three and four can't be coded. You have to write hypertrophy. And if they are in poor housing conditions uh, and everything else, these need to be put down. And you can see the money you get changes. But, and if you get uh, a child who comes in for investigation of recurrent wheezing, a very common problem, we've heard about it a lot today, um, you will see that you can put down all sorts of things. This was a referral from a hospital in London to Professor Saglani, um, which had, he choked on fruit. He had a family history of asthma, a personal history of asthma, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He was two years old, he was a boy. He came in for investigations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, I'm not expecting you to um, remember all this, but I'm wanting to show you the principle. So you will see that his primary diagnosis is wheezing, although that isn't actually correct, and you would get £644. However, if you actually change it round because he had other issues as well, you get, you can legitimately code it as other specified respiratory disorders, and everything else has stayed the same. Nothing has changed, and yet by changing it round, you, the amount you receive for what is a very intensive inpatient stay for investigation is now £2,900. As Franz Kafka wrote in the trial, the right understanding of any matter and a misunderstanding of exactly the same matter doesn't wholly exclude each other. I am not asking you to understand it. What I'm asking you is to uh, get the coders to look at things in a different way. So our experience is getting our coders involved on the ward really pays. They have a, a weekly meeting with the registrars and all the mistakes are ironed out. Make sure all the extraneous stuff about housing and parental and social, which never gets written in day cases, is written in the notes. If it isn't written, it isn't coded and won't be paid. Do not, and you get the coders to work by legitimate clinical rules, which fit in with their coding rules, which are very strict, but you don't allow the coders to accept any notes with things left out or in the wrong order. They come, they don't, no child now ever comes for a sleep study. Of course, you um, ethical people will say, well, you're just taking money from other trusts by doing it this way. And that is, of course, true. We will all run out of money together, but at least we will run out of it even. And it does keep the tanks off the lawn with the endless transformation and sustainability stuff that goes on. I appreciate this is a difficult subject to get your hands on, but it really does pay. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, this is a photograph of me aged three, which was the only photograph I was prepared to put on a screen. Thank you very much. Sorry about the slides. Not